Good afternoon, everyone, for today's webinar. And I'm really delighted to see a lot of old faces in this room. And welcome to everyone here in the room as well as online. Uh, we are extremely delighted and privileged today to have Guy Standing with us, who's back to the ILO after 17 years when he retired as a director of InFocus program for socioeconomic security. Uh, this is a webinar that is jointly organized by the research department along with the employment department, as well as the conditions of work department. Now, before I hand over the mic to uh, Guy Standing, let me say a few words about him. Guy almost spent three decades at the ILO working on a number of issues related to labor market and especially the distribution issues. And he has inspired a number of people within the ILO as well as outside, me being one of them. And I've had the privilege to work with him while he was at the ILO and also after he left the ILO. So I'm really delighted to see him here and to have him here at the ILO. He's currently a professorial research associate at the SOAS University of London, and he's also held positions of professorship at University of Bath in London, as well as uh, in the UK, sorry, and also in the Monash University, Australia. And he's had not only a great career at the ILO, but even after he retired, he has continuously continued his work uh, doing research on a number of issues, not only related to labor market, but also related to rentier capitalism and its predations and the need to revive the commons. And you can find a number of his books here on display. And if you're interested, I'm sure he's willing to sign and you can take one of them. Now, some of the books that he has written where some of these ideas have been presented are not only the very well-known and the famous, The Precariat, The New Dangerous Class, but also Why Rentiers Thrive and Work Does Not Pay, and much more recently, The Blue Commons, Rescuing the Economy of the Sea, where I think what's really coming out of that book is we're going to hear a lot more about it, but how the natural shared wealth the ocean that is actually being plundered. And I think there is a very clear need for us, not only at the ILO to look into these issues, but more importantly, to see how policy can be moved. Now, Guy doesn't just work on these issues. I think he has been very influential in setting up the basic income earth network that he has expanded to about more than 50 countries where he's been arguing for basic income as a right, and he pursues that relentlessly. Today, we are going to hear to, uh, from him about his new book, The Blue Commons, How Privatizing the Sea Expands the Precariat. And Guy, you have about 40 to 45 minutes to talk to us about it. And after that, we'll have Nile Higgins as a discussion. Thank you very much. Well, th thank you very much, Juma. It's a pleasure to be back, especially to see familiar faces and friends. And um, what I'm going to try to do this afternoon is, is picture this book and the themes that play through it. But as Uma has just been saying, it's effectively part of a cycle of books that began, I suppose, with the Precariat in 2011. It's just, the fourth edition has just come out. That's been translated into 24 languages and has taken me all over the world. It transformed my life as well as inducing thousands and thousands of people to communicate with me from all over the world saying I'm part of the precariat. And that goes with the other theme that Uma's just mentioned, that rentier capitalism has been the form of capitalism that has taken shape following the neoliberal economics revolution of the 1970s and 1980s, which effectively displaced the ILO's more social democratic model of, of the preceding decades. And in writing those two books, 
uh, on the precariat and rentier capitalism, there was one theme that kept coming up again and again and again, which was that the commons were a vital part of the informal social protection system that played a part in forms of work and in forms of social struggle throughout history. And it led to a book called Plunder of the Commons, which coincided with activities I was doing around the 800th uh, anniversary of the Magna Carta and the Charter of the Forest, both of which were sealed in 1217 in Westminster and are the, const the, the constitutional rocks of democracies ever since. And in writing The Plunder of the Commons, I realized there was one area that was uh, uh, omitted from that, and that was the Blue Commons. Now, I explain the background a bit in the books, but I want to give you a few stylized facts for us to bear in mind over the next hour or so. 71% of the world's surface is covered by sea. 40% of the world live in coastal communities. Half the oxygen we breathe comes from the sea. The sea contains three quarters of all life on our planet, 80% of biodiversity. You would not guess that from COP27 or COP15 in Montreal last December. The scant attention that the oceans received. Global warming is affecting the sea far more than the land. Economically, if the sea were a country, it would already be the fifth biggest economy of the world, and it is growing, the sectors in the sea, growing faster than, than the terrestrial economies around the world. The World Bank sees blue growth as the engine of total economic growth in the coming decades. And yet, only 1.6% of ODA goes to uh, countries and marine interests. Now add to those stylized facts a few stylized horrors. 400 million people will be displaced from their homes by rising sea levels in the next 20 years. One fifth of the world's population will become refugees from rising sea levels. 130 million people are dependent on coral reefs, which are disappearing at an incredibly rapid rate. Of 28,000 known species of fish, 34% are depleting faster than they can reproduce, and four fifths are at the point of that taking place. 11 million tons of plastic enter the seas every year, and that's rising steadily. No, it had causing incredible damage. Forever chemicals are even worse. Forever chemicals go into the sea, they go into small fish, get eaten by bigger fish, but the chemicals stay in those bigger fish and intensify as they go up the food chain. So the bigger the fish you buy, the more toxic chemicals it'll, it'll have. Meanwhile, there are over 97,000 ships of more than 100 tons each. The noise in the sea has doubled every decade since the 1950s, doing incredible damage to the breeding and migratory patterns of mammals and other fish species. Luxury cruise liners, these monstrosities that you see, I hope nobody goes on them, they use the dirtiest bunker fuel. And every time they go into a port, they leave their engines running all the time they are in port. And a study that I cite in the book shows that over 50,000 premature deaths take place around the communities of the major ports of Europe alone per year from throat cancers and other illnesses. Meanwhile, as I document, I hope in the book, the blue economy is the most cremogenic of all economic sectors. In other words, it's riddled with criminality. Now, if I haven't upset you enough, let me turn to the narrative of the book. Who owns the sea? For centuries, that question would have struck most people 
as ridiculous, but we actually know the answer. According to the Justinian Codex, which was the body of common law organized uh, in AD 529 by the Emperor Justinian, they came up with a fourfold distinction of property, forms of property, private property, state property, nobody's property, and common property. And the sea and the seashore and the seabed and all that's in the sea were listed as common property. Come to the definition in a moment. But that distinct set of distinctions fed through into Magna Carta and the Charter of the Forests and subsequent common law imaginations and, and legislation all the way throughout our history. So what is a commons? A commons is not open access. Get it clear, Gerard Hardin's infamous article of 1968, The Tragedy of the Commons, is a lot of trash. It was just basically a racist argument for private property rights. And he wrote, a, he wrote a sequel to that paper, which people don't quote who like Cardin. The sequel was called Lifeboat Ethics. He said the, the, the lifeboat is full, so we must not allow any extras from developing countries into our lifeboat because it will all sink. So we must turn them away from the lifeboat. Nice man, huh? Nice man. So anybody who celebrates Hardin's article should get, get, a, get a reality check. Something that belongs to everybody is a commons. Everybody who are deemed to belong to a particular community. And as a commons, commoners own or, or are responsible for the commons equally. A commons is inappropriable as private property or as state property. And it requires special governance. All the way through history, you will see that governance where the government or the monarchy or whatever the ruler is, has to be the steward, the trustee for preserving and passing on the commons. And alongside stewards, there must be gatekeepers, gatekeepers that hold the stewards to account to respect their obligations. Now in the book, the one chapter which probably will put more people to sleep than any of the other chapters, I define the commons going beyond Eleanor Ostrom's work, going beyond uh, many of the other uh, um, conceptualizations. And I think that's for the academics uh, amongst here, maybe some, but, but others in universities to whom I'm speaking about this. But there are seven principles that must be respected in a, coven, a commons governance structure. The first of which is the public trust doctrine, which is very important in the American constitution and in American uh, law. The government must act as the steward or set up bodies as steward to preserve the commons. What I call the social memory principle is that it used to be that when there was a dispute about a commons, being a commons or not, they used to go to the eldest people in the community and ask them to testify. And if it had been as commons for as long as they could remember, then it was a commons from time out of mind of man, as the phrase was. The other principles I elaborate in, in the book, but a very important one is the intergenerational equity principle. It's important that the value of a commons and common resources be retained and passed on to future generations in an equal amount. That principle has been incorporated into the famous Norwegian pension fund, uh, which is a model for the chapter 11 of the book. Now, the link with rentier capitalism goes like this. How is a commons lost? Well, it starts with encroachment and neglect. There used to be ways of checking so that uh, commons could not be encroached. Then there's enclosure. Then there's privatization. Once you've enclosed something for state property, it can be privatized. But then after that, separately, is commodification. It's not just privatized, but being allowed for sale and, and purchase. That leads 
once it's commodified, it leads to the growth of financialization, as financial capital is able to infiltrate. And that's a theme that runs through the book. And it goes with neocolonialism, which is, a, which is the main form that's taken in, this, in the oceans in recent years. Now, there, that's the uh, background, conceptual background. Let me now talk specifically about the blue commons. Well, the encroachment into the sea began with the beginning of oil exploration in 1937, and then took off after the Second World War with what's called the Great Acceleration. The Great Acceleration was when new technologies developed, which enabled people to move far and further and further away from their own, their own countries. And the little thing that happened in 1945 is an act of imperialism by the United States in what's called the Truman Proclamation. And the Truman Proclamation was when the United States victorious declared that all the, the uh, area around the United States up to 200 nautical miles was henceforth American territory. And this was strengthened by uh, the 1976 Magnuson-Stevens Act. But this act of encroachment and enclosure led to other countries saying, hey, 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 we're going to do some of the same thing. 200 nautical miles, we'll claim that for us. And this led to the most important piece of international legislation of the 20th century. Don't take my word for it. Take the UN Secretary General's words. He said that, that those exact words, the most important legal instrument of the 20th century. And yet when I was in the ILO, I don't remember anybody ever mentioning it. And in fact, when I was studying this, I don't remember anybody saying, I know all about it. And that's UNCLOS. In 1982, the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea was finally agreed. It was the brainchild of a wonderful Maltese diplomat, Arvid Pardo, who gave an electrifying speech in the United Nations General Assembly as far back as 1967. And it still it sends shivers down your, your arm because it's such a wonderful speech. He warned that unless an in, uh, international convention could be drawn up, to share the benefits with the whole of humanity, there would be international conflict and much worse. What the UNCLOS did was the biggest enclosure by far in the history of humanity. It enclosed one third of all the sea in the world, 138 million square kilometers into what are called exclusive economic zones. So that every coastal state was meant to have 200 nautical miles around in its, as its own territory, became state territory. Now, if I asked you, and if you didn't know about the treaty, if those who do know about the treaty would, and Paul Asfer here does because he's heard me prattling on over drinks over the past few years, but most people wouldn't guess what country has the most seabed and sea? It's France. France was given by UNCLOS 12.7 million square kilometers of sea. Shortly after that comes the United States, which didn't, it did pretty well, nearly as much. Then Russia, not be surprising, then Australia, then Britain. Britain got 6.8 million square kilometers. And as a result, Britain, and not only Britain, 60 other countries as well, that its sea area is 27 times its land area. I mean, it dwarfs its land area. And that's the case with many other countries. But there was one little beetle in the water. And that was China only got 900,000 square kilometers. Kiribati, got much more. Now, if you would follow the conflicts in the South Pacific taking place, just bear in mind that UNCLOS was a neo-colonial act of enclosure. And ironically, 
uh, China was one of the first to ratify UNCLOS in December 1982. Most countries didn't ratify until many years later. Now, since UNCLOS, there's also been what's called ocean grab. Because since 2001, countries are able to apply to the United Nations to extend their ownership to 350 miles if there's a continental shelf around their, their countries and not are covered by the 200. So bear in mind that UNCLOS had this huge enclosure. So that henceforth, anything that happened in that part of the sea was state property, not a commons. Well, what happened in UNCLOS was, as always with UN conventions and ILO conventions as well, of course, is that there was a set of messy compromises. Coastal states got their EEZs. The superpowers obtained the freedom of navigation all over the world, which they were exercising. Developing countries obtained a seabed mining regime that existed in their, their territorial waters, but not in the, the deep sea, the high seas. And very strangely, long distance fishing countries, such as Japan, the Soviet Union, uh, Spain, the United States, they had introduced into it a very strange concept. And I'll come back to that in a moment, but they were very happy with UNCLOS. Now, UNCLOS also said, we're going to set up an international seabed authority for mining. Come back to that later. But you notice in UNCLOS, this huge piece of legislation, there was nothing on workers' rights, nothing substantive on the rights of any people or animals and things in the sea. It was all a state grab. And the timing, of course, of UNCLOS was when this neoliberal economics revolution was taking place. So it began in the early years after Pardo's great speech as essentially a mechanism for sharing the benefits of the sea equally among all commoners of the world. By the time it came into fruition, after many rounds of negotiations, it was far more of a neoliberal uh, instrument. And that went with several things that were taking place concurrently, one of which was the establishment of UNEP, United Nations Environmental Program, which came into being December 1972, and the increasing role of the FAO at the same time. And here the story in the book, which I won't tell now for time purposes, is about a particular gentleman, a Canadian gentleman, whose name is Maurice Strong. And Maurice Strong played an enormously influential role from this period way into the 20th century. So, so much so that when he eventually died, all the great and the good, the World Bank, the president, everybody went to his funeral. He was that influential. And Maurice Strong was orchestrated Rio 92, the Earth Summit. And in the Earth Summit, the essential principle of a partnership model of development was enshrined. A partnership between governments, corporations, civil society, and finance. And it's henceforth, all the agreements and negotiations and conferences have been increasingly dominated by the role of finance, particularly Goldman Sachs, uh, the World Bank, regional development banks, and so on. And they have been the instruments by which the commons has been disappearing. Now, Rio and the bank, the World Bank at this stage, essentially were saying that the commons things that were common were not valuable. They weren't producing, they were holding back progress. And so therefore had to be displaced by private property rights. This was the theme that goes through the way and it's in the book. And private property rights became the leitmotiv of the World Bank. The World Bank has a strategy 
of privatizing 70% of all land in developing countries by 2030. It's doing pretty well, okay? And they reject common property rights altogether. The various sectors in the book that are covered begin with what's happened to fishing. Now, fish, as it happens, among the most commodified products in the world. 45% of all fish caught in the sea are traded internationally. That's much more than, than most things. And what's happened is the same process by which the commons have been lost and rentier capitalism has been strengthened. It begins with encroachment. The encroachment was led by the great acceleration of the 1950s. And what happened was long distance fishing boats were, were constructed beginning in Scotland and then the Soviets built up dozens of these huge boats. They are vast boats. And then they have purse-seen purse nets, which are two kilometers in length. Imagine that a net two kilometers and 200 meters down. Huge technology required and long, long lines developed that are up to 28 miles long quite a technological development. And worst of all was bottom trawling, which has been devastating uh, sea populations uh, all over the world. Bottom trawling was moved further and further offshore and has been a major issue. And one other technological development, which I've been out to see and I've experienced run into them in various parts of the world, are called FADs, fishing aggregation devices. They're they're contraptions out at the sea which bring thousands and millions of fish together so that these big trawlers can go along and, and take the lot, whether they need them or not. So there's been a technological encroachment. More significant politically has been the second thing, and that is a phenomenal growth of subsidies. Fishing in the high seas would not exist without fuel subsidies. When the, when the COP15 said, you know, we're going to pro, uh, we're protect endangered fish out in the high seas, they said we'd create marine protection areas. Much more effective way would be to stop fuel subsidies tomorrow morning. Because without fuel subsidies, there would be no high seas fishing because the profit rate is actually less than the cost of governments that are paying out uh, subsidies. And subsidies go predominantly to big scale fishing companies, okay? Five sixths of all subsidies, fuel, in, fuel capacity enhancement, efficiency, it all goes to big, big boats. And the subsidies have helped in the conglomeration and have helped with the financialized uh, control of fishing corporations. So now the world's fishing industry is controlled by a small handful of mega companies and they're turning uh, small-scale fishers into part of the precariat because they can't afford to keep the equipment, they can't afford to do anything like the, the scale, then they, they don't they experience the economies of scale and so on. So the World Bank give 95% of its subsidies to large-scale companies, only 5% to the 3 million or so uh, small-scale fishers. So that, that's a pretty strong bias, right? Now, privatization through subsidies has led to many developing countries suffering from a fish shortage. Now, Chile used to be the, one of the biggest uh, fishing co uh, countries in the world, huge coast, huge staple fish. Today, for various reasons described in the book, it has a shortage in its shops of the staple fish for the population. But the third story in the fishing story uh, is the growth of fishing access agreements. Now, Article 82, I think it is, I've got it in the book. Article 82 of UNCLOS said, remarkable thing, it said, any developing country that cannot technically catch fish 
up to the maximum sustainable yield must make a fishing access agreement with a foreign country. Must, shall. And this maximum sustainable yield was the brainchild of a crazy eccentric American uh, civil servant in 1949. He must have done it on the back of an envelope. He did an inverted U thing. He said, look, we should be fishing up to the maximum, not less, not more. And the reason we must do it, he, he clearly was a Malthusian. The reason we must do it is that it will thin the fish population. And thinning is necessary because that will leave the young virile fish to breed better. And that's why we should fish to this maximum sustainable yield. Now, I, I, I mock Mr. Wilbert uh, Chapman in the book, but don't laugh too loud because the MSY is still used today around the world and is still used by the FAO. And it's resulting in a huge depletion of fish populations. So here we had UNCLOS saying to developing countries that you must have fishing access agreements. So today there are more than 300 so-called fishing access agreements between Spain, between Japan, between the United States and a developing country. But most of all, they woken up China. China has dozens and dozens of fishing access agreements, mainly with African countries. And the evidence is that they basically, not just the Chinese, but the others as well, are paying about 5% of the total value of the fish they catch to the developing country. 95% for one, 5% for the other, seems a very good deal for someone, but clearly is not an equitable situation. Now, China has become the chief rentier state. And it's been using a concept that I've used in the book, odious leverage. It's Belt and Road Initiative. What they do is they loan to build a fishing port or build a fish storage thing. And then when the country can't uh, pay its debts, they say, OK, we'll take over the ownership, etc. And they've been doing it with other things. Now, these long distance fishing vessels which are over 200 meters long. Think about it, twice the length of this building, some of them, are well known for using trafficked labor, bonded labor, all sorts of abusive labor practices. A very good ILO study in, in 2013 exposed some of that, but it's much, much more extensive than Thailand, which was the focus of their act. So I haven't got much time to go into more of that part of the story, but the next part is the development of private property rights in fish. Now, the ancients would have laughed at this idea, but basically countries, more and more countries, are having quota systems where they divide up the, the, the fish populations and say to you, you can catch 20%. Fred, you can catch 10%. You can catch 30%. And what they're doing is they're gifting corporations entitlement to catch a certain percentage of the fish. And well, of course, once you create a private property right and then you can modify it, it means you can sell your quota to somebody else. And you don't have to be Marlon Brando on the waterfront to realize that a little pressure goes a long way. So what happens in country after country is that conglomeration has taken place, buying up the quota of the small scale, the little bits that they get, so that just a handful, very small number of corporations dominate through the quota systems. And of course, finance has come in because finance sees that with, with an oligopoly that results they can push up the markup prices and make huge uh, profits. So it's been a, 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 a very strong trend, this quota system. And the development alongside that is what's called slipper skippers. Slipper skippers. 
a skipper of those who are not English, the skipper is, is the captain of the boat. And a slipper is what you wear on your veranda in Florida, because a lot of people who've got quota have literally rented out to some poor part of the precariat who doesn't own his boat, he doesn't own the quota, he doesn't own that, but he's basically a wage worker and he has to pay for the maintenance and et cetera, et cetera, of the boat. So that's a phenomenal thing that's taken place. Then the fourth, the fifth point, and I'm running out of time, so I'm going to be very quick, just flag these things uh, for if anybody who's still interested in the book. And it's, it's a re relevant that having just said that, the next issue is flags of convenience. Now, most of you will know about flags of convenience, and there's something that the ILO should chase, because 33 countries have, you can buy a flag from their country, they don't apply any international conventions, most of those countries. A, many of the boats that I describe indulge in flag hopping. So as they move around the world, they change the flag because they like the legislation on this issue in one country and not, you know, they change even while they're at sea. The biggest boat out there, which is 228 meters long, is the Vladivostok, which is, which is uh, a fish factory. It's changed its flag seven times. It's owned by a Rosh Russian oligarch, and it's broken laws all over the world and escaped. Uh, escaped. Now, flags, flags are something that's unique to the blue economy. It really is. I haven't got time to go into it, but it's dealt with in, in the book. Turning next to aquaculture. In 1970, something like 3% of all fish eaten were from fish farms. Today, it's well over a half. By the end of this decade, it will be over two thirds. So two thirds of all the fish we eat are farmed, okay? It's the fastest growing uh, food production in the world. And it's gone through the same process, enclosure, where land and mangroves and helped by, uh, helped by the World Bank in developing countries have been taken over, then have been privatized, then commodified, and the amalgamation has taken place. And in the process, the commons everywhere has been destroyed systematically. One third of the world's mangroves on which fish and many other things depend for breeding and so on have disappeared since UNCLOS came into effect, one third. And it's not through anything other than finance. Finance has turned that those mangroves into, into commodities, and then they've been taken over. And fish meal, which is needed for fish farming, has become a neo-colonial activity. I never thought I'd say that when I started writing this book, in the sense that vast fish meal factories are constructed in developing countries, and they take all the small-scale pelagics, the sardines, the anchovies, all the small-scale fish on which the local fish, the local fishing communities and the fish populations depend. And they take them over, and they are so vast that they have the subsidies and everything like that. And they're exporting that fish meal for poultry, for pigs farming, for pet food, and for fish farms in the other parts of the world, and destroying communities and making them unviable. Now, bear in mind, for the final project, which I'm not going to get to, I can see I'm running out of time, bear in mind that aquacultural firms now are dominated by five, five companies in the world. The biggest one is called Maui. Maui is the biggest Norwegian thing. And in 2005, it was taken over by a rogue named uh, John Fredriksson, who was a Norwegian, but he didn't like paying Norwegian taxes. So he became a Cypriot citizen. And he made his initial billion from running crude oil for the Ayatollah in the, 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 in the war. And having got his first billion, he became the world's biggest owner of uh, oil tankers. He's easily the biggest in the world. He's sitting in London as we speak, and he has an estimated fortune of over $12 billion. And he decided he wanted to become the biggest salmon farm producer. So Maui took over most of the salmon farms in, in Norway, 
and has taken over most of the salmon farms in Scotland. If you see any fish saying Scottish salmon, it's Mr. Fredrickson's salmon, not anything to do with uh, Scott. They even take small salmon into Scotland to breed from Norway, their hatcheries in Norway. So the, the aquaculture thing is something, something ugly. I won't go into more details, but it's in the book. The next part of the story is the mining juggernaut in the sea. And here I come to my scoop, Mr. Khan. And the mining in the sea involves energy, deep sea mining for minerals, seashore sand, marine genetic resources, and offshore wind farms. Brief couple of words on each of those. At the moment, the world gets 30% of its energy from the sea. And that's growing at a rapid rate. In my own country, it's 80% from, from the sea. It's heavily subsidized. But meanwhile, the major oil companies led by BP are destroying coral reefs and things around the world without any abandon. BP at the very at this very minute is destroying the world's biggest deep sea coral reef, which is enormous uh, breeding area for numerous species of fish. And it's destroying commons communities. But the second part of the story is something I would like to see the ILO do some serious work. I, maybe they have done, but I haven't seen it. What is the most mined mineral in the world? It counts for 80% in terms of weight, not of value, but of weight. It's called sea sand. And every year, 50 billion tons of sea sand are excavated. We use it for concrete. We use it for nuclear shelters. We use it for glass. We, because desert sand is too fine. It can't be used. So it has to come from the sea. By the end of this decade, it's going to be over 60 billion. It's a major cause of soil erosion, disappearing islands, estuaries collapsing, and so on. And it's extremely profitable because it's completely unregulated. I haven't seen any attempts to quantify the working conditions, the need for standards, the needs for protection for sand workers. And in fact, the sand mafia in various countries is notorious. India is, as you know, the story probably in North Africa, but many, many parts of the world. And sea sand is, is something that, that is, is disappearing fast. It's very endangered uh, uh, mineral, actually. Then the third part is you will see some stories at the moment about deep sea mining. Under UNCLOS, deep sea mining was not allowed until a mining code for ecological and social issues could be developed and a sharing mechanism so that the whole of humanity would benefit equally. That was the two conditions set up in 1982 and was the two conditions that were essential for the group of 77, for example, to accept UNCLOS. Now, they set up the International Seabed Authority in Kingston, Jamaica. It didn't get set up until 1994. And if I work it out, that's 28 years ago, and they still have not managed to come up with a sharing mechanism or a mining code. And then and the great country of Nauru spotted an obscure clause in UNCLOS, which said that if a country or company and a country applied to ISA to start deep sea mining, ISA had precisely two years in order to come up with a mining code, to come up with a sharing mechanism. Otherwise, they can go ahead. Now, the marine scientists are unanimous that if deep sea mining takes off, there will be huge ecological damage, belittling anything that's happened up to this moment. And yet little Nauru applied in June 2021 to start deep sea mining. So a time bomb is ticking, ticking, ticking. And June 2023 is coming up very quickly, if I'm not mistaken. Now, the, 
Meanwhile, a number of countries have woken up. Germany government is an all alert. Spanish get all alert. A few others are, are alert. World Wildlife Fund, with whom I'm working, are, are all are getting up in arms. They're, but it's still on the books. And the pressure is mounting. And here comes my scoop. Last week, Nauru was clearly pressured, probably offered quite a bit of money. It's a disappearing island in itself. They've written a letter, as far as I'm aware. I can't say to whom, I can't say by whom. I'm not allowed to say that, so I haven't said it. Um, saying they're going to suspend giving this Canadian company that is out there with all the equipment for starting deep sea mining and it's doing exploration as we sit here, pumping stuff out from thousands of meters below. They won't give it unless a standard is drawn up. Now, if this letter is accepted, it's, it's pretty significant. At the moment, there is still much to go on. I will leave it at that. But there's one other area, and then I will move to the final bit, which is marine genetic resources. UNCLOS did not realize in 1982 the value of organisms in the water, let alone the value as private property rights. But since then, led by the German chemical giants BASF, they've developed capacities and have over 13,000 patents for marine genetic resources, which open up a vista of billions of dollars of profits. Now a patent with WIPO down the road means they have a monopoly profit for 20 years on each patent, right? And BASFA has 47% of the total. There is no way that the German government or the United States government or Japan, which have predominantly all of the patents, are going to agree to a commons sharing agreement. No way. Then I'm going to leave out the Winshaw Farms because I'm running out of time very quickly, because that's an ugly story in the week of coronation of Charles III in Britain. Because Britain, as I say in the book, the, the monarchy has been selling off the British seabed to multinational companies so that they can build uh, wind farms, enormous wind farms with, with ecological damage terribly. So then I get briefly to the port story. There are 835 ports in the world. They've been privatized and increasingly they're owned by Chinese capital. Extraordinary. A large percentage of the ports of the world are now owned by Chinese capital or private equity finance. And they're enlarging these ports. They're deepening and they're making them inaccessible to small scale fishers and other uh, communities. And so that story is relevant for the overall narrative. I come to my last set of remarks. What is, what should be the agenda? Now in the book, I describe governance reforms that are needed to resurrect the commons in different ways, chapters nine and 10. And chapter 11 goes back to my original theme that I developed in while working with several of you in the ILO back in the 1990s, the creation of a commons capital fund through a payment of levies on those who are taking from the commons or benefiting from the commons or are polluting and depleting the commons. And you build up the fund. And as the fund is built up, you can pay out common dividends, form a basic income uh, in different respects, depending on the, on the resource. That's explained in chapter 11 at length, so I won't go into it. But what I would like to propose by way of conclusion is that the ILO should develop a set of policy proposals to take to the Ocean Conference that will be chaired by Macron and the government of Costa Rica in Nice in June 2025. All the COP processes have neglected the social and economic issues that should be central to understanding how to save nature, save society, and be more equitable. And yet the ILO, as far as I'm aware, I may be wrong, has been pretty silent. We need an agenda that says 
The commons must be resurrected. It is part of the traditions of work, sharing, uh, redistribution. It is part of our relations with nature, building an ecological future that is grounded in respect for workers' rights and human rights in general. And it should be built with a clear strategy of dismantling finance, stopping finance having control. The trouble at the moment is in all the sectors I've discussed, finance through private equity has become the dominant business model. I show that in the book. And private equity goes for short-term profit maximization. So they deplete resources, then move on. Move in, move out, take the, take the profits and move on. We've got, instead of that partnership, we've got to say, finance must stay out. Why is it that producer organizations in the sea are dominated by corporate interests from finance? Not specifically of the fishing industry or what, but by finance. Why is it that the, the regional fishing management organizations are dominated by finance? Why is it the mining is dominated by finance? We should say, hey, that's not part of what the UN should be all about. And the ILO is ideally placed, and I've got a list of policies which I won't go into now because I should shut up, but I think the ILO can play a great constructive role in the upcoming negotiations, starting with COP28 this year and going through into the Ocean Conference. And I really hope you do that. Thank you very much for listening and online as well. Thank you, Guy, for that very fascinating and passionate speech and a lot of shocking and worrying insights as well as facts and a lot of food for thought. I think I'm going to give quickly the floor to Nalo Higgins, who's a senior economist in the Employment Policy Department, who was asking us me in organizing this uh, webinar, and he has some insights and some comments to share. Over to you now, you have about 10 minutes. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, thanks Guy. And uh, yeah, this is, uh, this is really a remarkable and I think important book. Uh, it deals with a wide ranging discussion of, of many, the many complex issues related to the, the Blue Commons, um, marine based resources, both fisheries, well, there's a lot of emphasis on fisheries, but not just or so on on deep sea mining and, and those related issues. And it has, I think, some more general, uh, important uh, uh, pervasive themes. So there's the commons, of course, and, and its significance of common resources. Uh, there's also, uh, which we haven't heard so much about today, is, uh, uh, yeah, is, is the, the, this is implicit theme of the interconnectedness of choices we make as a society. And that's very clear in the, in the blue economy as a whole, that, that how one thing influences another. But it does raise the question in my mind, which I'd like Guy to, to maybe reflect on, to, to what extent we can solve the blue economy issues without uh, the, uh, other issues that are facing uh, uh, society that, that are indeed related. The other thing that, that again, Guy didn't put much... At, emphasis on, but I think is important, is the general uncertainty and increasing uncertainty regarding the future that we have. And uh, I know that it, there's concern as there's the concern with the instability of regular employment, and that's that's uh, this uncertainty regarding the future. I mean, I study young people particularly, and, and this uncertainty regarding the future has become very clear and got worse during, during uh, COVID. Um, but was already present before. Of course, then there's the privatization of commons, resources which should more appropriately and traditionally were seen as common resources for the usage of the commons or common good. And you criticize the, the market-oriented uh, uh, neoliberal view that the solution to the problem is the attribution of private property rights in this case, uh, or initially state appropriation and then the attribution to, to private property rights. And this is, of course, linked to your arguments about uh, growth of financial capital and the consequent attachment to what you said, the the, the short the attachment to short-term profit maximization as a goal. And it's linked also to the growth of carrier as a class. Uh, and in the book, you tend to identify that with insecure wage labor. And I'll, I'll come back to that 
uh, specific point. I think the book does a really good job of covering a large range of impacts and and uh, on the marine environment and of human economic activity. It also um, and and guys touched on several of these today. It's, it's, it, it it notes a lot of the sort of proposed solutions which will actually make things worse. Like the the, the it talks about some aid projects which have tended to promote the development of large scale fisheries uh, with negative consequences to the blue economy. Of that the perverse effect of interventions, eco branding to which only large scale uh, enterprises can access and this this thing about there's a nice story it's, it's quite a lot it's quite uk centric and there's quite a nice story well several nice stories about brexit and the uk one that that the paradoxical thing that brexit was was proposed as a, a growing autonomy for 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 the uk but for for fishers who who exported most of their catch british fishers uh, fishing people um brexit actually worsened the situation because then they were faced with 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 the uh, uh, the tariff barriers which it, which actually impeded the the uh, uh, or it affected their livelihoods. Um, again, aquaculture, as we heard, is not a solution, not necessarily a solution. And there's this problem of the low cost, uh, local, uh, small, small fish, and so on, uh, and the, the sea based wind farms. Okay, all that has been uh, covered in, in, in great detail. What I remain remains a sort of question in my head is, is to what extent is the degradation of the blue commons linked to increased precariousness or the growth of the precariat? Uh, that is definition that I got. I don't know if it's Guy's definition, but I got it from the, the, the internet people whose employment and income are insecure, especially when considered as a class. But my, my question there is, how secure is the employment and income of those who depend on the sea intrinsically, I, even if resources are held in common? I mean, small scale fishing, which is which is a central part of the discussion in the book, uh, is that what we want to go back to? And, and how secure is that in the light of climate change more generally, which I suppose raises the more general issue of, of how do we deal with these, this, this, this blue issue of blue economy without more generally dealing with climate change? And um, yeah, more direct relevance to 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 uh, to ILO concern. Or my, uh, my concern as an ILO official is like, like uh, you talk a lot about uh, fisher people being forced into insecure wage labour. Well, we have a sort of we typically in the ILO tend to talk about wage labour as as a sort of as a, as a positive step, the shift from from own accounts vulnerable employment to wage labour as 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 a as a positive step, but. I would mean, be particularly, um, particularly, I guess, in the light of what I'm saying, sort of saying before, the, the the issue of is what are we going back to? What does that actually imply in terms of economic organisation of these these these? these uh, are we going back to small scale? Should we be going back to small scale? The other thing I, I would mention is that I mean, the increasing pro precariat, et cetera, et cetera, but. Uh, and you talk a bit that the basic goal should be raise the living standards of the poor, but actually this has been happening. I mean, at least in absolute terms, uh, living standards are improving or have been improving significantly. Extreme, what we uh, define as extreme working poverty, the extreme working poverty rate, a uh, number of people, the share of the population who are working, uh, living at a, at a, at a below a, a certain level, I think it's one one ninety one dollar ninety per day, has actually been fallen quite remarkably in the last uh, uh, 20, 30 years. And and so there have been, in terms, absolute terms, what you've seen, there's growing inequality and growing in particular high, the, 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 the extreme wealth, but... Um, yeah, maybe worth commenting on, but the 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 main thing I suppose that I'd like to um, is 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 maybe you can say a bit more about what the solution looks like. I mean, yes, you outline actually seven principles I think of 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 how how this should be organised, rights, subsistence, and amongst those you you mentioned one the the intergenerational equity principle. principle. I think particularly with the blue economy, another one that is really important is this precautionary principle. That is, we don't know what the effect of our actions are today on the future, and so to combine with the the intergenerational equity principle, I think that's very important, but the fact we simply don't know the, 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 the impacts we're having. And so then we have basically a, a sovereign fund based solution, which I suppose underlies a basic income type idea uh, with some specific uh, proposal on levies. I'm, I'm, I'm 
I'm wondering yeah, how this solution links to other issues that we should be, and, and to what extent is this, uh, how actually do we get there? I mean, the, part of the problem seems to be the state because, because of the appropriation of, and the selling off of state resources to the private sector, which, which underlies. And, you know, is it, how realistic is it that we actually can can get to to that point and i think maybe with that i'll i'll, I'll show up and leave the, uh, leave the floor back. thank you so much Nile, for those comments uh i think there's a lot more in the book than what uh guy has talked to us about there are lots of parallels that he draws between the land and also between the green revolution and the blue revolution and a lot of other insecurities that uh, are brought about. I don't know, Guy, whether you want to respond to Nile or whether we should take a few more questions from the floor and then go. Would you be fine? Uh, yeah, I'd, I'd like to respond just one point. Okay. I have responses on the other point, but, uh, but let's hear some uh, comments from the floor. But my one comment is this. I, I've given about 600 i'm serious 600 presentations on the precariat in 40 countries and i must have emphasized in at least half of those presentations that i do not define the precariat by insecure labor insecure wage labor the original latin for precariousness was to obtain by prayer the essence of being in the precariat is you are in the process of losing the rights of citizenship. And you're losing common rights and common civil rights, cultural rights, economic rights, political rights. And it's this lack of uh, rights that goes with the changing relationships to the state. The old proletariat was linked to the state. All our ILO conventions and recommendations were about giving entitlements, we call them rights, to the proletariat. But the precariat has been systematically losing rights. And that to me is far more important than the fact you have short-term contract. I had a short-term contract a long time here. And, and this for me is important because the losing of rights goes with the point that you make that we are living in what I call the age of uncertainty. And that for the ILO is another challenge because when we set up Convention uh, 102 in 1952, it was the beverage Bismarckian model of contingency problems. Today, it's chronic uncertainty, unknown unknowns. That's what people are facing. And we don't have a system of social protection which responds to that change in the nature of insecurity. I'll stop at that point. Thanks, Guy. Anybody from the floor? Yes. Yeah, hi, thanks. Brant Wagner. Introduce yeah. yourself. I'm Brant Wagner from the ILO um, Transport and Maritime Unit. And uh, yeah, thanks. I, 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 and I caught, I'm sorry, but somebody scheduled some event uh, on Ukraine in the middle of this, which I had to go to. So I was part, I, I hope there's a recording of this. I'd like to listen to it if it's possible. I, no, I bought the book out of, out of my own money. I didn't make the ILO pay for it. And, um, and I intend to read it. I, I started re looking at this morning, but we're just overwhelmed with things. So, but I wanted to ask two questions. One was the proposals you're making, you suggested proposals, let's say to the UN Oceans Conference, the next the proposals for the next UN Oceans Conference uh, to be uh, hosted by France. Are, are they all in the book? Or if you have something in addition to that, it would be nice to see them. So I could read the book, but also I'd be curious of what you proposed. And then in that line, um, do you have any specific hooks to the targets under SDG 14 that you would hook what you're saying into? Because, you know, we're a little bit in these conferences constrained by responding to the targets that have already been set. And we didn't get all the things that we wanted. But if you have any ideas on how we could link to those targets, that would help us in, in our strategy. Thank you. A very good point. I, I do have discussion in the book of the SDG 14, and I do have uh, some of the proposals that I think the ILO should take into in into the ocean conference. Um, so in in a, in a sense, I'm happy to to extend that. I have got various things. I think many of the 
many of the things that the ILO could do are derivative of some of them. For example, the Port States Measures Agreement, which 74 countries have signed up to, that, that Port States Measures is about going on board vessels to check up on whether a, a vessel has been doing illegal fishing. But there is no reason why we shouldn't be pressing that they go on board to check whether they're doing illegal labor practices as well. So that's just an example. Well, just, just, to, just to share on that one a little bit in defense of the other. Actually, we've been working closely with the FAO because the Port State Measures Instruments and FAO convent, you know, instrument and, yeah. um, and, and the International Maritime Organization. Actually, it's just in that line to see how we can coordinate with them on these issues. And our colleagues in the forced labor section, fundamental section, they're producing, for example, guidelines on identifying forced labor on fishing vessels and the idea is you can give it that to the port state and the port state measures inspectors so they can see it they're aware of it and then set up a protocol so they know who to call when they find forced labor so we're trying to do all these things with the other UN agencies uh, concern and uh, the RFMOs as well but of course uh, we need to improve this and it, it you know we're, we're, we're working hard to improve this coordination with other UN agencies because when we do that we also get access to the other ministries that we don't sometimes get as much access to here you know we tend to work with labor but by working with FAO they work with uh, agriculture and fisheries and working with IMO they work with maritime safety so we're trying these things but that's why we'll read I'll read the book and and, and, and derive from that as well what, what you've uh, suggested thank you as for Thank you. Um, <clears throat> first time I went to a, a seminar in the ILO in 1979 was a seminar where a guy was presenting a paper. And uh, I was told by my boss, because I worked in another department, he says, don't spread yourself too thin and going and wasting your time following up on labor market issues like this. Anyway, the the important point is that you have pinpointed, I think, what is a potential weakness in the ILO, which is, and this is not so much a question to you as to some of the young ones who are running the ILO now, is that who are you gonna get on your side in dismantling finance capital? I think this is a fundamental point. In my days, our employers, God bless them, were basically people who came in with personnel department backgrounds, HR managers mostly. The real captains of industry were not there after Tata. Tata was probably the first and the last of real capital. But finance capital. I don't see where they are. So that's a question for me. And I think it's a very good point. I mean, that is really the, but where, how do we find that leverage? Thank you. Uh, yeah, that's a great question. The obvious answer is that the precariat are the potential mobilizing vanguard, if you like. And there are now estimates being done all over the world, that something like 40 to 50% of the population could be defined as part of the precariat, okay? And a lot of people have comment and respond saying, I'm part of the precariat. Why my son and daughter are part of the precariat. You know, there's a lot of identification. They don't ally themselves with the old social democratic model. Sorry, they don't. They don't see the benefits but they do look for an ecological future they do look for a future that gives security and freedom and 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 they relate to the commons so that's that's one so, sort of answer funnily enough uh, sorry to be saying this it sounds sounds name dropping but i've been invited to talk three years in a row at davos uh the world economic forum and one of the sessions they put me in was a debate which has been streamed with Larry Fink. Now, Larry Fink is the chief executive of BlackRock. And BlackRock owns about 30% of the world's shares. 
minor matter, trillions of dollars. He's, he's the most powerful financier in the world. And I debated with him in public and in, in private. And many of those people, and, and with others I invited to talk, uh, yeah, crazy people I never expected to or dreamt of uh, spending time with, many of them are actually running scared because they know, and some of them have said, some billionaires have told me that, that they're running scared because they're winning too much. And they see AI coming, they see finance increasingly, they're seeing Goldman Sachsism everywhere, revolving doors, the things I've written about in, in the Corruption of Capitalism book. And they, they fear, as one put it, the pitchforks coming for them. So now we are having, we are having a situation, this partly responds to the other point, where at the moment there are 150 plus basic income experiments going on in the world. Okay, if you told me when we formed Bien that that would happen, I, I, you, I, you know, I said you've been drinking too much, and we're getting we're getting huge improvements, and many of these people are putting big money into experimental schemes. I'm advising on the government of Wales. I'm advising the Spanish government. I'm advising. The, the Nepalese, or, or it's happening. In, it's a sort of revolution from below. And it's not yet reached the point where we can be confident that we're going to have a basic income thing. But, but in the Korean presidential election last year, our candidate, member of Bien, got 49% of the presidential vote in the runoff on a program of introducing a basic income. Korea, I'm about to go off. Uh, back to Korea, where we're having a huge conference. There, there are countries that are just there. I believe there will be a domino effect because we've got to have a change in the income distribution system. We won't get it through raising the wage share of national income. Rentier capitalism won't allow that. Sorry, the globalization is such that that won't happen. We've got to have ways of redistributing, recycling the rent, the rents. And that, I think, appeals to the precarious and appeals not just to the precarious, and other groups as well. So I, I'm pessimistic on a Monday, a Wednesday, and a Friday, but optimistic on some days. Thanks, Guy. We have a colleague from, on, who's online, uh, Lawrence Johnson from the research department, who has a question for you. Can yeah. you allow him to ask? Okay. Hi, Guy. I mean, uh, just to say, it's you, know, you may remember me as Jeff and I. Can you hear me now? All right. All right. Is it working now, Uma? Just a minute, please. Okay. Uh, yes, you can go on. Okay. Can you hear me now, Uma? Yeah. 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 Okay. All right, Guy. I mean, you may remember me as Jeff, not Lawrence, but I'm sure the name's uh, familiar. The issue is I'm looking around the room in the audience. I see a lot of old colleagues uh, like Duncan and others. Guy, you basically, you know, basically really make me stop and think about this because one of the issues we always look back to the history of the ILO, why was it founded on tripartism? And that was to bring both capital, labor, and governments together. And I think you're absolutely right. A lot of people are really running scared because of the imbalance that we see today and how we move forward. And with the DG, we're having these discussions on the social justice declaration. And I wanted to get your views as one of the things that we keep saying, and I've been a country director in the Philippines, and I've dealt a lot with ADB and others, is it's not so much how you isolate capital and go against it, but how you change the mindsets of the people, the World Bank, the IMF, the ADB to understand about how to get this inclusion. And I also do agree with your perspective is when it comes to the issue of getting the wage share up, that's not enough. How do we move that forward? So again, if I were to say to you, how do we move this forward in terms of getting the World Bank and the IMF and others to basically shift this paradigm into more understanding how we have the inclusion? Because again, I'm very close to the issues around the ocean. I'm a dive instructor. I spend a lot of my time in the water. I see the destruction across the globe. 
And how do we make sure that this is working for the greater good? So to me, I, I understand your issue about short-termism we see with many corporations this quarter and next quarter, but how do we shift that mindset and how do we do it in a, in a timely manner? Because I personally do feel we're running out of time when it comes to the environment and also when it comes to society. So let me just pause there. And I apologize for not being there in person, but I had other commitments this week that took me out of Geneva. Thanks a lot, Jeff. Yeah, thanks, Jeff, for very pertinent points. I, I think if I, if I can make any contribution in this debate, it's to increase awareness of what has been happening in the name of finance, in the name of partnership, in the name of the deprivation of the commons, this negative attitude about the commons and common property and commoning as a as a, a type of activity, and and I think we can engage with the bank more confidently than than social agencies have done so over the last forty years. Instead of being defensive, actually say, look, what you're doing is actually not contributing it's making things worse Se decrying commons communities and commons traditions is wrong this is something that you know you cited about there about the fao the fao has a lot to answer for i'm sorry has a lot to answer for they they used to send out people who would tell the natives how they should modernize their economic activities in and around the sea. They were, they were dubbed scientist ambassadors. And of course, they were ignored indigenous and vernacular knowledge traditions. I discussed that in the book, which were grounded in history as a way of reproduction, a way of relating to nature so that nature had its respect, okay? I don't want to over romanticize some of those things, but if that was the essence of the commons. And to go back to your question, Niall, is, is I really want respect for the commons to be brought back, which means that we have to respect those seven principles, including, which is in the book, the precautionary principle, very important, this totally disregarded the World Bank has been giving loans for conversions. And then after doing it for 20 years, they said, oh, let's do some case studies. Case studies to see what effects they're having. Should be the other way around. And, and the, I think the ILO is well-placed to be the world's social conscience again. Okay, But you have to have confidence in a model, in a framework, a paradigm, if you like, and I think the commons as an entry point and commoning, let's have respect for the work of commoning. It disappears from statistics. It disappears from conception. But historically, people spent a lot of their time in activities that I would call commoning. Okay? Not labor, not work in care or whatever, but in commoning. Let us resurrect respect for commoning because that is what's held societies together hundreds of years it goes back to the guild traditions occupational guild traditions which the ILO has never supported never so for me it's a matter of altering the paradigm but it's consistent with the values of the best people who've gone through the ILO don't don't, don't throw the baby out and all that stuff it's a matter of reorienting away from jobs 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 I don't want to be in a job. I've been mu worked much harder since I've been out of my job. And, 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 you know, let us think more constructively about care work, voluntary work, common in community work. And that, I think, is, is a model that puts them on the defensive. Should have seen Larry Fink. He was furious. <laughs> so, I mean, I... Thanks, Guy. Anybody else? Shukti? I think I can't but say something. So it's a pleasure to listen to you, Guy. Um, you know, it takes me back those many years when we worked together. The point uh, I wanted to make is what you 
your basic thesis about you know the commons and the eating away of the commons for private gain is uh, you know you sp you've spoken about the um, ocean economy but i think it was also you who pointed out i mean this is a general trend i mean you the statistics you quoted about the ocean is very striking and it's something we don't usually know and see at least for me but this trend of eating away of the commons of making milking the commons if you put it that way has been happening for quite some time and it's also part of the distorted power relations that we have in society and at the same time i won't go into you know i mean you've raised many valid issues about what the ilo can do and you know the importance of rights and importance of workers rights human rights but we also see at this time a lot of strive, a lot of collective action in in Europe. You know, you see in in England, in in the in in France. So I'm just wondering. I mean, what is the way out? I mean, history. If you look back in history, we have gone through phases where we have had this kind of ups and downs. So at this current point, which is a very difficult time geopolitically in terms of different you know, very um, also the kind of governments that have in many countries, developing countries, what is the possible way out? Is it through this kind of social strife that we see that the precariat, as you say, will have bigger voice and that will make a big change? Because honestly, I mean, we all are for social justice, but it's very difficult today to see where that road is, you know, what will take us to what we all aspire towards. The values of the ILO are there, but what is happening around us, I mean, what will break this um, this current conundrum, if I may put it that way? I want to I want to respond to you in a in a positive way because I believe that there is there is the an incipient rebelliousness an anger out there. And early in the COVID, I got a strange call at my house from a group called Massive Attack. And Massive Attack said they wanted to make a video with me. And I thought it was a lefty friend of mine uh, pulling my leg, you know. And I start, didn't take it seriously. And then I asked my friends in the arts world, should I take it seriously? They said, are you idiot? Of course you should. And we made a video. It's only, it's a short video about this issue, really. It's about precariat and basic income and lack of resilience. And it's gone viral. It's been, been viewed a million and a half times. Uh, I get, I, every day I get somebody writing to me about it. And essentially it, it's about where are we going to have our energy? Where are we organizing? What should I do? You know, they they do. And I believe there is that there is this energy out there. Mm -hmm. And those of us who are, are listened to, that's that's all everybody in this room included, um, have a duty to, to say to people, don't sit and moan, join. I'm working with Ocean Rebellion lovely group of activists some of their ideas are just crazy but it's the extinction rebellion i'm working with them i mean the, the, some of their ideas are crazy but you know how do i know they're crazy they they could be the ones that cracked the, the egg whatever so for me that we we shouldn't be pessimistic we shouldn't be cynical and sit back we shouldn't go back to the old agenda either right I wrote a book called The Precariat Charter. Asking myself before I wrote the book, I said, how would, how would, if the precariat were to come up with a set of policies, a set of reforms they want, what would it look like? And how would it differ from a proletariat charter had it been written in 1919 when the ILO was set up, right? I set, set myself, a, uh, was rather conceited to have it, trying to answer such a question but you come up with a very different agenda with different priorities and you come up with moving 
to walk as one of the 29 that I list that I described in the book, 29, number 28 is moving towards having an income security floor. Everybody has a basic income right. We can afford it. All our experiments, I've done the big one in India, we, we covered 12,000 people, okay? The change in those communities as a result of where we did the basic income. Oh, it makes me cry when I go out there. Yeah, you, you know that. And, and this, these things are percolating into the, into the mainstream. And, and therefore, it's up to us, basically, to say, come on, we've, we can do better. And to take on the World Bank, take on the, the IFAs, take on the financiers and, and mock them because they're doing, they're doing incredible. And this, this mining business, if it takes off, oh. and of course, it's finance behind it. So we've got, to, we've got to tackle that. And the corruption of capitalism and the revolving doors, we should be exposing that. You go from senior political positions into senior finance, into Goldman Sachs, and then Goldman Sachs back into the senior governments. It's, it's like that. And I list all the people. Thousands of people have been doing that, including the latest British prime minister. Um, you know, we, we have a job to do. And, and it's an exciting job. I wish I were 20x, not something else. But, but I think that there, there are people in the ILO who can take the agenda forward. Thanks, Guy, I'm sir, and probably you're the last. Okay, thanks. No, it's just a follow up to what Shakti was talking about, you know. And you see, I mean, in any kind of a development, people will say that there are winners and losers, and uh, you know, we know who the winners are and who the losers are. And the destruction of natural resources is not just about natural resources; it's also uh, taking away of opportunities from a lot of people, the losers, so to speak and the inequality that it has more or less sort of bred. But I mean, again, the point that Shakti was making, you know, the, in terms of the action, should we look forward to kind of a multilateral, multi-country, you know, that kind of an action to resolve the situation, or should we fall back on the role of the state? But I say that with a certain hesitancy because I do know that, I mean, even states are now basically um, taken up by elite capture. So, uh, particularly finance. So, say the last just, just the last, well, last little anecdote to send us off for a well earned drink uh, for, for you for listening. There's a little island of Korea that has a, quite a small population, and they happen to produce sea cucumbers. Now, sea cucumbers are a delicacy for the Chinese. And for a while, there was a corporation that was manufacturing and selling the cucumbers to China. And the people of the island said, hey, 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 enough of that. This is part of our commons. And they've converted the sea cucumber production into a cooperative, a commons, where they pool the uh, incomes and provide everybody with a basic income. And so successful has it been that their annual basic income today is $10,000 a person in that island. It's a beautiful island, uh, but it's a small microcosm of how an income distribution system can be changed and have a wonderful effect. Nice story. Thank you so much, Guy, for that. Uh, hope note in the end and I think I think we all need to have a lot more of hope in ourselves and the next generation to ensure that some of the challenges that we face today we can find some innovative solutions as we move forward and I think Guy in his book there's a lot more that is there so I would really encourage all of you to read but he also gives us a new strategy for blue commoning. And I just hope that this is something that is politically feasible, something that we can put in place uh, using an international governance system, which is not corrupt and which ensures fair distribution. So thank you so much to all of you for listening. 
online and all of you for coming here and being with us. Thank you so much, Guy, for coming up here. And there are a few copies of the book here. Please. Thank you.